The next session today is about the replacing language and place, uh, understanding terms that were perhaps used in the past and how we reinvigorate that by reintroducing language as it was. We've got three great speakers coming up and then we'll have a chance at the end for you to ask questions. So do get thinking about those as we're going along. And uh, when we get to that bit, you just make sure that you're holding the microphone, wait until you get to the microphone and hold it nice and close so that everyone else uh, can hear you because otherwise the acoustics are a bit difficult, uh, particularly up the back of the room. But to get us started uh, this morning, um, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Elizabeth Moylan, a certified geographic information system professional who is an honorary associate of the University of Sydney School of Geoscience and the owner of Burra Mapping Services with a background in surveying and experience in environmental mapping. Now she, her current research interests are in cultural landscapes, people's connection to landscape, and in particular how uh, historical maps are formed and reframed. Uh, with you this morning to discuss using historical maps to identify European recordings of Aboriginal language and the, in the Illawarra region. Ladies and gentlemen, please make a welcome, Dr Moylan. Uh, thank you. So good morning. Um, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners, the Yunnawal people on whose land we meet today, and pay my respects to the elders past and present and future, and to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders here today, and further extend this to all First Nations people here today. Um, I'd like to also thank the National Library for the invitation to this conference and for the fellowship opportunity that I'll be taking up in mid-March. Um, this is a curatorial research fellowship and it's funded by the patrons and supporters of the library's treasures uh, gallery access program. So I'd like to acknowledge them as well. So furthermore, I'd like to acknowledge that I'll be speaking today primarily about the land of the Dharawub, and I recognise the traditional owners and people from that land. Um, being a map obsessed person that I am, uh, here is a map to help you locate in Australia where I'm talking about. So it's the east coast of Australia, south of Sydney, in a region known today uh, as the Illawarra and part of the Darrell land. I just want to take some time to acknowledge that I am a non-Indigenous person speaking about Aboriginal history. My intention is to be respectful and I will appreciate any feedback that might help me improve my approach in the future. So I'm here um, as part of my own research to explain to you the things that I've um, identified or I'm not representing any history, um, I'm just passing on my experiences. So quickly to outline my presentation, using historical maps to identify European recordings in the Aboriginal language in the Illawarra region. First, um, I will be looking at reviewing historical maps to see Aboriginal place names and words. So I'll give you a couple of examples of some maps. Then to look at stories that may emerge from this reviewing, thinking about how this process can be used to decolonise maps. And then next, looking at making historical maps accessible for reviewing. And then finally, exploring new maps that provide reviewing opportunities. So I start today with this image, and it's of, Sir, um, Rob, of Robert Hoddle's um, survey party uh, on the route to Kayama, south of Wollongong, uh, from Bongbong. And this image is a good way to look at reviewing. This image can be viewed from two ways. Firstly, one way is to reflect the title and the artist. It's a surveyor marking out an access track in land that is new and unknown to him. Hoddle might see bushes getting in the way, gullies to cross, measurements to be made, progress to come. Another view of the landscape can be from the perspective of the Aboriginal person in this painting, this image. And let's assume for a moment that this person is a local person or they know the landscape. What might they see? A song line, dreamtime stories, ceremonial sites, bush tucker, a country that is cared for or a country under threat. So by looking from different cultural perspectives, new information might come to light. The landscape and the image can be reviewed in the same way that paintings can be reviewed and looked at from a different perspective. So can historical maps, creating a view that's an alternative perspective to their original intention. 
what might we acknowledge about Aboriginal cultural landscapes when we move to decolonise the viewing of the map? So here is a map um, from that area that the image has taken. It's the parish of Kayama map, and I'll just we'll zoom into a smaller area. This contains information about Surveyor Hoddle's path and some of the Aboriginal names that were nearby. So one way to identify the Aboriginal names in the, is in the map. And in this section, we see the parish of Jamboree and the Tangara waterfalls. In this later edition, the name Tudawollan is mentioned twice, once as a gully and then again as a survey station. So identification of names is one way, but there's definitely more to the stories of these names. How and when did they appear on the maps and what can they tell us? So I'm going to move you through a series of maps just so you can see how some of these maps appeared and possibly consider a new story behind them. So here is an early European map. It's considered a topographic plan of settlements of New South Wales and it was published in 1799. To put it in the context of European history in Australia, Cook visited in 1770, the first fleet arrived in 1788 and at this time, explorers Bass and Flinders had recently been sailing down the coast. And this is the area of interest. And just to reduce any confusion to the map showing north pointing to the right of the page. So if you're trying to orientate yourself, just keep that in mind. So the first thing to note is that there's not that much recorded on the map. And that's not surprising given the minimal interaction with the local Aboriginal people and the exploration being done by sea. There's Canoe River noted, and this is where Flinders did have an encounter with the local people. Names given are in European names. Canoe River, Hat Hill, Tom Thumb Lagoon, Martin Islands. What is absence of, on the map is also of importance. The Europeans, their presence is small. The impact on the landscape is still to come. Hooved animals, mass vegetation removal, wheeled vehicles, enclosing land, fencing. The landscape at this time does represent a map that was created in what Gamage refers to as the biggest estate on earth. It's a landscape that predates European influence. It represents a landscape under Aboriginal management. Despite the map's stated intention to communicate European settlement extent, a reviewing offers a map of a landscape pre-European arrival, although shown on this map as unknown and empty. The next is a published map 15 years later. Europeans have ventured further down into the Illawarra area, as you can see by that list of dates on the slide. There has been some more interaction with the local Aboriginal people. And this is our area of interest here. In this map, there are more details of the landscape provided. We can see the names, still European, Coal Cliffs, Red Point, that's from Cook. But the name Alauri appears, and this is provided by Bass, appearing to refer just to a, a general area. We still have Hat Hill, Tom Thumb Lagoon, and now a new one, Bass Point. There are a couple of Indigenous names appearing, the Cataract of Garagangaring, but it's a name that's not kept in the future. Mutawatan Creek, name again not kept, indicates the start of European overland explorations. It's, po it's possible that Mutawatan was a name after an Aboriginal man known to the Europeans as Daniel, who worked with explorers in this area. Here's another map of the settlements, and this time we're in 1817, and the aim of the map is to report the settlement extent and opportunities back to England. And we're going to have a look at this section of the map. Now we have the lake called Illawarra. Illawarra is not used in this name. What has increased is the identification of land types, lagoons, low sandy areas, good grazing land near the lake, high mountain ranges and forest grazing land, and a track to Appen. By now the European gaze has turned to seriously look at the value of the land from its economic value and activities. The first cattle came over the escarpment was around 1815 and the cedar cutters were only a little time before that. But you'll notice we've still got Hat Hill mentioned up there too. 
The next map is 1834, a map of the Illawarra. And this map is part of a report on the progress of roads to the area. This map does have Aboriginal names. Kira, Kembla, finally replacing Hat Hill. Wollongong, Taroji, Balambi. Two things have changed. First, there was a directive from the Surveyor General Mitchell in 1828 instructing surveyors to record local Aboriginal names to help Europeans locate themselves in the landscape. In demanding the recording of Aboriginal place names, Mitchell has inadvertently contributed to the recording of Aboriginal words. Secondly, there was the increased interaction between the Europeans and the local Aboriginal people. As has been discussed, it's likely that these place names do not accurately reflect the locations and names that are put into these maps, and some of the meanings have been lost. In the Surveyor General's directions to the, to the surveyors, they were asked to simplify and to shorten names, making them easier to put on maps and for Europeans to pronounce. However, does this accuracy reduce the importance of these names? Is it still significant that the local voice is heard and recorded? The map can reflect conversations between Aboriginal people and the Europeans. By 1866, there were still Aboriginal names recorded, but there are a lot more European names now. The names of the land grantees clutter the map, reflecting the increasing population numbers and the change in the cultural landscape. But this map shows colonisation. The Aboriginal names are important because they tell a story of occupancy and traditional ownership. This is another series of place names, and this is my last. This story, um, using historical maps, is recording names associated with Lake Illawarra. And starting with that previous map, the 1866 county map, you'll see that there are barely any names. The names there are for the big landscape, such as the Illawarra. By the 1895 edition of the same map, there are some more names appearing, Aboriginal and European. Many extra names are added by the 1923 edition, so I've colour coded these here with the yellow ones um, being Aboriginal names and the pink being European. Where did these Aboriginal names come from and why are they placed on the map so long after the Europeans had arrived? Some research indicates a push by the community to restore Aboriginal names. Names were given to electoral seats and parishes and towns. The local newspaper even reported on knowledge of place names and arguments as to the correct names were had. In this case of the Lake Illawarra, Mr Brown recalled a conversation with uh, Rosanna Russell, who was also known as Queen Rosie, who had been born on the shores of Lake Illawarra. So these maps can reflect the story of a conversation between Mr Brown and Rosie. They give a voice to Rosie. Part of the decolonising view of the map is to make the map accessible for those looking for these kinds of stories. So given the wealth of Aboriginal place names on such maps, such as these parish maps, it would be useful to be able to search for them using keywords. A look at the cataloguing keyword and comments options, though, indicates that that's not yet possible. This is the catalogue item for the 1923 parish map that we just looked at. And you'll see here that the notes, they do not mention that it contains Aboriginal place names or words, the subject keyword does not indicate Aboriginal place names or words. This is the same map from another catalogue. The subject, no mention of Aboriginal place names or words. The language, it's only in English. There's no mention of Aboriginal place names or words in the notes. And although it wasn't the purpose of the map to record Aboriginal place names, a change to the cataloguing would be a move towards decolonising this map, and I suggest it would be appropriate and desirable. Where the keywords are available, what research do they reveal? In Trove, a search engine uh, that connects library collections throughout Australia, searching for Aboriginal place names in those maps, um, there were five maps for Aboriginal Australian um, place names. When I searched uh, Aboriginal Australian names in Trove just under maps. There were two maps. A search for names, geographic 
Aboriginal Australian in Trove responded with three maps. And this is, I'm talking about the whole of Australia here, the whole of Australia. So when keywords are available, they need to be used. Another way to make place names available and to decolonise the maps is to make new maps. Replace the place names, replace the features in the landscape. And so to finish my presentation, I want to share with you three examples of newly decolonised maps. This is a first contacts map of the Illawarra and it restores place names and records new names. But this map is not in the library collections. It's a poster from a government department. To be useful, it needs to be added to the collections and correctly catalogued using keywords and notes. But what keywords could be used? This is a map by Tracy Andrews and Lynn Moore. It's artwork and it shows um, song lines over satellite aerial photography or satellite photography. In the catalogue, it's under the subject of art, but the format is listed as a map, but at least it's in the catalogue. And then finally, and this is one of my current favourites to finish my presentation, this is an artwork called You Are Here Now by artist Megan Cope. It's at the Australian Catholic University in Fitzroy in Melbourne. It's a historical geological map with Aboriginal names and symbols placed over the top. This is definitely an inspiring way to replace language um, and place. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr Moylan, please give it up. Continuing on our theme of replacing language and place, I'll next be welcoming up Associate Professor Helen Gardner, an historian at the School of Humanities and Social Sciences at Deakin University in Melbourne. She's written extensively on 19th century colonial anthropology anthropology in Australia and as well as across the Pacific Islands. Uh, recently, she's explored contemporary Indigenous use of 19th century archival resources and that's exactly what she'll be speaking about now in this presentation entitled Contemporary Communities and 19th Century Archival Materials. Ladies and gentlemen, please make her welcome. Thanks very much, Dan, for your welcome. And thanks uh, also to uh, the National Library of Australia. Uh, but I'm going to start by um, thanking Paul and Tyrone and Jai for their very gracious welcomes to country uh, over the last couple of days uh, and uh, how important it's been for me to be engaged in those uh, extensive conversations uh, that's been uh, moving and powerful and so I too acknowledge that I'm on land of the Ngunnawal people and uh, like others uh, I acknowledge those who are here today in representing um, Indigenous peoples around the country and beyond. I'd like also to make a special thanks to Sharon who's saved my bacon many times, as she may also have for others who are speaking in this conference. So thanks very much, Sharon. Um, you've been very helpful. I've learned a lot in the last two days uh, from this conference. The project I'm speaking about uh, puts me, I think, in the position of being a mechanic, uh, and I'm very you know, happy to be a mechanic in this instance. Uh, in this talk, I want to run through the relationship between a project that I'm involved in and the uh, one particular Aboriginal community uh, that we've been working with closely. Um, I want to offer some of some of the insights we've had in, in uh, dealing with these materials about uh, working with large, uh, massive 19th century materials and how best to, to manage this, particularly on the because there's just so much um, there. So I'll start really by introducing you to the people on whom this archive is based. Uh, the, Bo, the question is, to what extent is the huge collection of materials gathered by these two men actually the work of these two men? Or can we think more broadly about these archives? Laura Mafison was a missionary to Fiji. He spent most of the time there in the 1860s and 70s and some of the 1880s. Um, he was a missionary, he was a teacher, he was an anthropologist, 
and uh, he wrote that book there in the middle with A.W. Howitt, Gamilaroi and Gunai um, in 1880, but he's best known in Fiji for a um, little article that he wrote and was published called Land Tenure in Fiji, which went on to become the source of the codification of land uh, in those islands. So he's remembered in Fiji, pretty much forgotten here. A.W. Howitt, of course, um, Laura Mofison's partner, is known to most Australians as the man who found the bodies of Burke and Will. Um, Wills, two men who probably shouldn't have been let out to go and get the milk, I've always considered. <laughs> That's perhaps a little unfair. Uh, Howitt was the right man to go looking, though, I'd have to say. To historians, Howitt is acknowledged as a police magistrate in Gippsland in the decades after the... Um, phenomenal, horrendous massacres of that region. Um, to anthropologists, he's one of the founders of the discipline of anthropology in Australia in the period pr before it became a university-based study. For Aboriginal people, particularly the Gunai Kurnai people, and I'm speaking particularly of, of them today, um, how it is first and foremost a recorder of kinship language and also an inveterate collector of information from around the continent of the, in, during the late 19th century. So this is the project. Um, it's an ARC linkage project, and so we've been funded to conduct this um, project uh, with a range of institutions and a range of people. So the aim is to audit the archival material, um, held in the names of these two people, developed, collected by Howitt and Fison in conjunction with Pacific Islanders and Aboriginal people. Uh, the aim also is to digitise and transcribe this material in partnership with Aboriginal people. Um, I'll speak about the Pacific uh, component later. Uh, and the ARC partners. So there are linguists involved in this project. There's Stephen Moray, Pat McConville, who's also an anthropologist. There's a digital humanities linguist, uh, Rachel Hendry. Um, I'm a historian. Our industry partners are VACL, Victorian Aboriginal Corporation for Languages, Native Title Services Victoria, now First Nations Victoria, the State Library of Victoria and the Melbourne Museum. Uh, we've recently added a young PhD scholar, a man called Corey Theatre, who has links uh, uh, to the Gunai Kurnai people of Gippsland and also the Wachibalak people of the um, uh, Western District areas. So, to return materials to Aboriginal communities in a usable format developed in conjunction with them. Now, this is the problem, though. Um, it's the scope of these materials. There are thousands and thousands of pages. And they're in different institutions and they are catalogued differently and they are all handwritten. So Museum Victoria, the Howitt papers in Museum Victoria are over 7,000, including correspondence, field notes, circulars, etc., etc. For some reason, the Howitt papers were separated, we don't know why yet, between Museum Victoria and State Library Victoria, where there are about nine boxes of correspondence, articles and primary data, 13,000 manuscript pages, but some of these are family papers and not really relevant to our project, so we were able to do a, a very quick cull. Laura Mafison has six letter books here in the National Library of Australia, about 800 pages each. Uh, Rochester University USA holds about 800 pages of correspondence. St Mark's Theological College Library has about 2,400 pages of Fison's correspondence, together with more um, drafts and primary data. So. Our ARC has community engagement built into it, both in the budget and in its rationale. Uh, but it's one thing to promote the obvious benefits of community engagement and another to figure out how to do it. And I remind you again of the daunting size of this archive and how overwhelming it is. For me as a professional historian, uh, I, I went weak at the knees when I first saw the extent of this archive. Uh, I, I thought, I, I'm. I haven't, I'm not going to live long enough to write um, much 
uh, useful about Howitt. Um, it's, and his hand is appalling. He's, he's very, very difficult to read. It makes you feel sick, actually. <laughs> um, so, first of all, it was a nightmare, and second, it was doubly a nightmare because of the, of the range of, of the ways that the material was held. Um, and I just want to th take you quickly through that. If you type Howitt into the State Library of Victoria um, Museum catalogue, uh, yes, State Library of Victoria Museum catalogue, you get this kind of record. It's up here on the left. Um, it's relatively detailed, and there is a finding aid, which is actually very old, written, I think, in the 1970s, but, you know, the material was left to them decades earlier, so it doesn't matter. And the finding aid isn't, isn't bad, actually. It's not too bad. Um, so that's one, one, you know, s site. If you type Howitt into the museum's Victoria collections, there come up three results, three objects. So there's thousands of documents held in Museum Victoria, but because they're a repository for objects rather than for documents, they're catalogued in a different way. The catalogue is held within the museum, so you can't actually get access to it unless you are actually in the museum. So that was a further issue for us. We do have an industry partner. We're working with the museum, but it created extra problems. It's like, I guess, having all the bits of a car, but not having any diagram in which to put it all together and not actually having access to the bits in the first place. So um, it was not easy to know where to begin. Um, there's no way we could transcribe all this material ourselves. These are handwritten documents. The very few that are typed were largely those that went on to be printed as articles or books, so there's no special value in those. Um, but so we made a start. We made a decision and we made a start. Our, a number of people who are working on the project said, well, let's try crowdsourcing this material, um, to the transcription of this material. Uh, the project manager, a young guy called Jason Gibson, who's uh, central to the project, he started to investigate it. He said, we, he found a site. He said, I think this one looks pretty good. We actually trialled another one. Uh, we all said, well, what about, you know, we're making these materials public. What are the issues relating to this? What, well, sort of public. You have to sign in. You have to, you know, take active part if you want to transcribe. He said, let's just do it. So we did. And they were transcribed relatively quickly, the first that were put up. There has been about 280 sets of documents transcribed. There's been 1,200 pages transcribed. There are about 26 transcribers, of which some are work from the communities with which we are working. Um, so let's have a look at how this works. And I think, is Michael here? Yes. Um, I know you were very uncertain about cr crowd fun, um, transcription, but I'm just, and I was too, you know, I'm a historian, I work, you know, alone in the archives. But I just want to take you through what happened when we started. So you, if you want to try this, you, you're welcome to. Um, our um, PhD student is going through the materials, making sure there's nothing uh, sensitive as far as the Gunnokerno materials involved. Um, so this will take you through, you click onto one of those. I'm not, I was nervous about working on it live, so I've actually just used screenshots. And then you'll go through to um, a, 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 a letter and you can start transcribing with the um, instructions below. So here we have a letter by Bulmer to Howitt. He was a missionary at the Lake Tyres Mission and he was very involved in um, um, uh, the collection of materials. He and Howitt worked quite closely together with a number of Aboriginal people. Um, the originals on the left, of course, the transcriptions on the right, yes. Um, now, this, I think, was transcribed by one of those employed as a casual on the project to transcribe and review the materials. And she worked at First Nations Victoria for a year or so and has a special interest in Bulma. So people with special interest in these materials are able to kind of go in and work on them. Now, if you cl as you'll see, some of these are hyperlinks. The things in red are hyperlinks. And if you click through on somebody like King Charlie, 
you'll um, be taken to this kind of, this page. Uh, you get a kind of cloud diagram referring to his presence in the archive and also a hot link to all of the pages where he is also referenced. This is one of the categories, uh, that's people. But there are a number of other categories, in particular language terms. Um, here, for example, is the um, description, ex explanation for the term glian, the purple swamp hen, and also what has been described as a totem term. Um, so you can actually um, put further information in there. So we're, we're working, a lot of people are working on this. Uh, they're checking, they're going in and saying, oh, I don't think that's right, I don't think that's necessarily uh, how that should be spelt or we need to reconsider the, the way that explanation's been developed. Um, so that's, that's how we're going with this um, material at the moment. We, early on, before we really had started the transcription process, we made contact with Gunno Kurno people through the GLOWEC umbrella organisation that manages requests to work on these materials. We invited a group of people to Melbourne to introduce them to those in the State Library and the museum. And look, you know, they know they're there. They're, they're very familiar with a lot of these materials, but they're just not, um, they're just such, such hard materials to work with. You know, they're massive, they're huge, they're, un, they're chaotic in some instances. Uh, so they just, you know, they just wanted access and were disappointed that they'd struggled to get access in the past, uh, partly because of distance, you know, Gippsland's a fair way from Melbourne, uh, partly because, for example, the Melbourne Museum materials had been given to them, uh, to people in Gippsland in the 1990s, but on floppy disks. And so that's no longer relevant. You can't use those anymore. Um, so, you know, watching, working with these um, Gunnar Kernai men, it was actually initially who came to Melbourne, you know, it, it does bring these materials to life. And it's a reminder that everybody brings their own views and their own perspectives to these archival materials. Because immediately, you know, people were just saying, oh, that's my grandmother's auntie, or that's my, you know, that's clearly my um, uh, such and such a person, or here's this relationship, here's that relationship. You know, while I only had access to those materials through Howitt as the collector, how it was kind of irrelevant, not irrelevant to, to the uh, community people who were working on it, but they immediately saw their own um, family members within these archives in a way that I wasn't. So it was um, um, uh, fascinating for me. Uh, I don't want to go on for too much longer, just another couple of minutes, okay. And then these relationships started to dictate what we might focus on. Uh, so there was particular interest in a ceremony organised by Howard with Gunnar Kurnai men and a special hunt went on through the archival material to find those materials and then put those up. Let's work on transcribing those. And this man here, Russell Mullet, working here on the left, um, uh, started to work very closely with Stephen Moray and they've um, got a pretty good relationship. Now, that led to some co-authoring of um, materials and in particular something that's just turned up in the conversation on the famous white woman of Gippsland who was shipwrecked and um, saved by Gunnar Kurnai people and lived amongst them for some time. Uh, and um, Stephen Moray f initially found this uh, song in the Howitt material in the State Library, um, and so he's, he worked on, on that. And then he and um, Jason Gibson, research fellow, and Russell Mullet worked on a piece for the conversation on um, the uh, uh, experience of this woman according to that song. But actually, it's not really accurate, the um, attribution on the right there. Um, Stephen Moray, yes. Jason Gibson, yes. Russell Mullet was co-author here, but the conversation says, no, you have to be uh, university-based if you're going to be a co-author. Um, now, I can actually see why they do that. You know, otherwise, the conversation is going to be co-opted by science, uh, 
uh, big pharma, all those kind of people, they're going to kind of feed their ideas through. But it's a problem for us because we want to really acknowledge that these are this work's been done as, um, as part of a, you know, shared relationship. So, and that speaks also to the wider issues of the um, uh, archive in that these are archives that are co-productions. You know, Bulma could not have written that letter unless he'd been in dialogue, close dialogue, with uh, the people about whom he wrote. So let's go back to the Bulma letter just very quickly. Um, here at the bottom here, I give these instances just as Harry gave them. So that's Harry, he's speaking to Harry. At the same time, the rest say they acknowledge nothing but Yarang and Jitgang. So there's discussion, there's debate. And then do you think these Y and D are the two divisions having other divisions? So he, now he's speaking to Howard. Um, so all of these materials, these, uh, this, or so much of this material is built on dialogue. Uh, and the dialogue is so easily lost when you um, go to these archives. Uh, they're particularly written out in the published things that come from these materials, but they're co-authored, they're co-written, they're um, not really Howitt and Fison. They are actually, um, uh, they're, they're materials produced from conversation, from the muddle, from the dis discussion, from memory, from their notes, their aids to memory. They're all sorts of, of complex archives. So I want to just finish by making that point. This is not actually finding Aboriginal agency or Aboriginal presence. This is re-reading re Aboriginal people as kind of, you know, it's obvious, of course, they couldn't have been written without Aboriginal people having these conversations, but it's easy to forget that that is the case. Jason Gibson's done some, a really great article on this. Uh, people might be interested in reading that, Finding the Dialogic in 19th Century Colonial Archives, uh, and it comes also from his in-press um, book, Ceremony Men, Making Ethnography and the Return of the Strello Collection, which is another big project. I'm gonna leave it there, thanks. Professor Gardner, thank you very much. And I tell you what, I don't envy the job that you've got ahead of you, those tens of thousands of documents spread <laughs> right around the world. But thank you very much. We'll look forward to some questions shortly. Uh, rounding out this session is uh, Dr. Peter Sutton, an author, anthropologist and linguist who's lived and worked with First Australians for 40 years since 1969, a specialist in Indigenous land claims, languages and art. He's written or edited 16 books, the latest of which are The Politics of Suffering in 2009 and Iridescence with Michael Snow in 2015. And this morning he's talking to us about the mapping of Aboriginal language countries. Ladies and gentlemen, please make him welcome. Thank you. Now I can wake up and can wake an end. Now I can watch them. I can't numbered it. Tyrone and Jai, Paul, I can in the minimum Ak minna, ak al, kanna. Just a message to our hosts um, saying, not thank you because there is no verb for thank you in that language I was speaking, but one can always acknowledge. And that language is one that I wasn't born to in Melbourne in 1946, but it was one that I was uh, placed into by adoption when I was a young man uh, 40 years ago by uh, Victor Wallaby at Arakoon in Cape York Peninsula. And as far as people there are concerned, although I'm still a white fella, I'm also a member of the Wallaby clan. I have a clan estate called Ike. I have a dialect called Wignatan. And I have the, uh, about 15 totems which belong to that group. Um, part of which is to say um, don't be tempted to too much make a simple division between mechanics and traditional custodians. There are increasing numbers of Aboriginal people 
who are mechanics and good ones. And vice versa, there are quite a few fogies like me who lived long enough in the bush to be taken into families. I'm going to be talking about um, a, go a good story. It's the story of the, the overcoming of misunderstandings of the relationship between language and country in Aboriginal society. If you go back to the earlier accounts, even the more sophisticated ones from the 1920s, 30s, 40s, um, and to some extent Howard as well, you'll find that the, the so-called experts are saying that an Aboriginal language country or a tribal territory, as they would put it, is based on behaviour. These are the people who live in that area, that is, they camped in that area or dwelled there, and the people who spoke that particular language. Now, both camping and speaking are behaviours. It's taken us over 100 years to come to the realisation that that is, in fact, not how the old people themselves understood the relationship. For them, it was not primarily one of behaviour. It was an inherent relationship and a sacred relationship between the languages that were put down into the earth at the beginning of time by the, the founding dreaming characters and the people who belong to those places through descent from an ancestor. In other words, speaking a language didn't make you a member of the tribe. The people, uh, the old people that I've worked with in remote areas, and I'm sure it was the same down here in the old days, were quite fluent in three, four, five, six languages. That didn't mean all of those six languages were theirs. It didn't mean all of those tr language countries that belonged to them. What it meant was that they were able to travel respectfully uh, and talk to their in-laws, for example, or their spouse or their children in a multiplicity of languages. But as people moved around, it didn't mean that their language countries moved around. Their language countries were incredibly stable, enduring, and it would be, a, it would be an act of sacrilege to have simply voted on a, on a move of country from A to B just because the people had moved from A to B. That's not how people would see it. I actually have written things down, and now I'm talking without notes, so I'll go straight to the slides. Um, I should perhaps say what a language, uh, language country isn't. It, it, it isn't one of those um, uh, things as described by Tyndale, although his map does show language countries, and we'll get to those soon. I'm going to focus my discussion on one part of Australia only, and that's Cape York Peninsula. And I'll focus it on, I'm not sure where the laser is here, but I, there we are. Uh, that area there is generally known as the Wick region. It's famous for its native title case that went all the way to the High Court and changed Australian property law. If you go back to some of the older maps, this is Donald Thompson's. It wasn't based on just interviews or literature. He actually bushwhacked with pack horses for months and months over several years. He visited by boat, by his yacht, the Ewai. He was very good at learning languages. He mastered at least the elements of quite a few. He was a highly ethical researcher. And he produced a map here which distinctively shows no boundaries, but it does show uh, a language name and once only in each place and that would be a language, a tribal country, as he would put it. <clears throat> this is probably much more familiar to you. This is a bit of Tyndale's map, which is widely used and widely known. <clears throat> and Tyndale was one of those who believed that these actually showed dwelling areas and clumps of speakers, which is not, not how it works. <clears throat> You'll also notice that Wickmorgan, which is that area there, oh sorry, that area there, <clears throat> it's shown only once, it's shown only inland. As we'll see, that's not the case. The person who really cracked the understanding of the fine grain of how this works was actually in the Cape York case, if not in Australia generally, an American anthropologist called Lauriston Sharp. Sharp had the privilege of moving among people who were still living in the bush in their camps had not yet come into Mitchell River Mission, 
they were in touch with the mission in some cases. But over a couple of years, he spent many, many months travelling in the Mitchell River area, mapping the estates of small descent groups, these, and which he called Patrick clans because membership of them was determined by who your father was and who your father's sisters and brothers were and who their father and father's sisters and father's brothers were. It was a patrilineal system, not uncommon in the world. And what Sharp was able to show, because he was there on the ground and did the mapping detail, was that these, uh, every clan estate had a particular dialect association, which he uh, shows using, using these little abbreviations, so there's Yiriorant and Yirmel and so on. In other words, he wasn't just mapping large-scale language countries. He was starting from the ground up, starting with the local clan estate and building a picture of the, la of the wider language country using that entry point which to the people in those areas at that time were actually the most important ones. The primary thing was the small, the tiny little uh, clan estate and clan group. The group might be 25 or 30 people, the estate might be something you can walk over in half an hour if it's on the coast, maybe two days if it's inland. Um, he also subgrouped the dialects of these clans into larger entities which he called languages or language communities. And those are the, uh, those are the words in, in uh, boxes. So Kuguan and Wikian uh, and so on are dialects of a language which he called Mukun, although it's different from Wikmukun. Um, and down on the coast here, he, he identified all of these dialects as Taur, but he also showed the distribution of the particular clan estates, which had different, differently named uh, varieties, Kukutayant uh, and Kukuyak and so on. And uh, this is just a a rather blurry zoom in on his the legend where he explains what he's doing. And uh, so he, he says, Roman numerals show the moiety of the clan and the estate. The uh, Arabic numerals show which patri clan it is. And the initials show which language that belongs to. Now before Sharp started uh, in that area, just to the north of there in the, in the Wick region, Ursula McConnell began her intrepid uh, field work over a long period from 1928 to 34, intermittent. And uh, she, this is her based at Arakoon. She was a, a, an extensive user of pack horses, but she also walked and mapped country on foot, including treks like 240 kilometres in the heat in Cape York in 99% humidity with, uh, with a, someone carrying her shotgun to keep them in meat, which didn't always happen. And she, uh, after this 240 k's on one occasion, she, got, she arrived at Rookby Station. She was there to order horses, pack horses, for the following year's field work. And she said, um, my stockings were in a dreadful state and I just had to get put on a fresh pair as I got to the station. <laughs> <laughs> you have to, have to imagine a world in which a, a lady who went to a private school like New England Girls' School and who'd been to King's College uh, uh, in London and been trained and spoke French and all the rest of it. Uh, she wasn't to be seen even, in, even by the crows and the, and the gum trees as uh, having bare legs. It would be atrocious. Anyway, here she is with her, her bearers. She did carry food around, but only, only tea, flour, sugar, um, that sort of thing, salt. <clears throat> and she had no base maps available made by the Australian government. There weren't any. Uh, not at the scale that would be of any use. So she had to draw her own. So this is a fairly inaccurate map of the same region. Um, I've lived and worked, I was based in this particular area in the bush over several years, on and off, uh, living and based at an outstation called Watanin. And uh, it was there I, I learned language by immersion, which is pretty much hard to get away from. If you really want to learn a language properly and you don't get immersed, then you, you're, up, you're up against a brick wall. Um, oops. But you'll see that here again, she's got one Wikmungan, and it's inland. On the coast, she has Wikalkan, uh, Wiknatanya, Wiknantira, and so on. 
Now this is, this is the sharp, Lauriston Sharp area down here. And uh, that's where Aracoon is up there. Uh, Aracoon is sometimes in the news. You might have heard of it. Anyhow, she did a wonderful job. Um, but her travels were linear. Before the age of the four-wheel drive vehicle, these mapping expeditions, including those of Tyndale through the Manor Musgrave Ranges and so on, were usually in a straight line. People weren't ranging off physically locating hundreds of sites as we did in this area later with using um, entirely overheated and overrated Land Rovers. Um, they were either on foot or with pack horses. So this is a pack horse trip she did for 19 days with missionaries and a large number of local people. Uh, leaving Aracoon, it's the black line is, is the trek out and going down through this country um, which I mapped in 1976-77 with people who'd grown up in it and who were, some of them were actually the children that she, she met in 1927. Um, so they get down to Ngatang on the Kendall um, and they then made their way back. That's Ngatang, a photo by David Martin um, who lived in the bush there. He and I did a lot of co collaborative mapping together. <coughs> Um, we, together with John von Sturmer and John Taylor and others, <coughs> we mapped uh, probably two or three thousand sites on the ground over since between 1969 and 1999. Uh, I have to say, a process that was very rapidly driven by the traditional owners of the country. They were lining up to get into this. They wanted they wanted recognition. Uh, they wanted their claims registered. Not only vis a vis. Comalco, the mining company, or Joe Bjorka Peterson, but against all the other families in the district. Uh, there were many audiences for this work. I'll skip that. <coughs> um, as each anthropologist went into a new area, they had to be inducted in by, given, by being given armpit smell to make them familiar to the spirits. And you'll see in this photo also evidence of the fact that uh, there was no way you could separate <coughs> anthropology and linguistics from hunting. <clears throat> if you didn't hunt, you didn't have any protein. <clears throat> um, this is mapping uh, with Isabel Walby, who took over as my main mentor and was my primary language teacher for several years, uh, mapping a site. And, and people say, oh, a site is an area. No, actually, generally speaking, a site has an absolute focus that might only be a metre across. And here it's that well. That well is Turpinitz. Also, the, the shade is Turpinitz. The, the little area around it is Turpinitz, but that, it wouldn't be Turpinitz without the, without the well. And that's Isabel. Those old people, you know, they never sat, they never sat doing nothing. They were always doing something. Uh, Jack Sleep was a typical case of someone who'd grown to adulthood in the bush, knew the country backwards, was multilingual, and was desperate to get back and show me everything about his place. I also included this because he had, was such a, a strong, strong-looking character. When Victor died, um, Noel here took over as my next daddy, and uh, he had grown to full maturity in the bush. He had almost no English, and you can see we're very dirty. And he saw it as a chance to prove. He would hold up things, saying, "This is my camp from before." These are my bits of house. This is, you know, this is where I lived. And that's Alan Wongby at the site of the first outstation in Cape York Peninsula, founded in 1971, which was ca which he carved into that tree. <clears throat> Sometimes the site can move. In this case, it's, it's a female stone uh, at a place called Umtunt, and uh, when you come back next time, that stone won't be there. It'll be somewhere else. She runs around. Anyhow, it's in the same it's in the same area, but it's not always in the same place. It's the only rock in the whole of Western Cape York coastal system. They, the nearest thing they have to stone there is a bit of shale around one one river. <coughs> but in general, <coughs> this is a stranger um, geologically, but it's not a stranger culturally. So some of this mapping was not done by a Land Rover. Mercifully, it was done on horseback, um, and quite often it was done on. Foot, you can see some of the country is quite daunting for a vehicle. We also only could carry a certain amount of water, so we were constantly digging wells. I'm getting to the end. Okay, uh, 
people memorized the, the pro forma and started um, teaching is basically recording the sites like that. There's a film you can watch to see how that process was done. And I'll just, that's actually what the landscape looks like in the, in the record. And that, that's what it looks like on the official maps. So basically through the drive of those people, um, a, a completely different and more sophisticated view of their relationship to country uh, was established in the, the hands of anthropologists, lawyers and judges and that was what helped them win the WIC case and these are WIC people celebrating. Okay. Oh. Dr Sutton, thank you so very much. And I'd like to welcome up uh, all of our panel to come up now and uh, we'll take some questions. If you've got one, just throw your hand up. We've got some microphones that are floating around. Make sure you've got that first before you ask your questions. But I'll welcome back Dr Elizabeth Moylan, Associate Professor Helen Gardner and Dr Peter Sutton now. So any questions to get us started? Just down the front here. I find it really compelling that um, it's quite clear that becoming involved in Aboriginal anything, particularly this um, language work, mapping, anthropology, does draw you right in as a non-Aboriginal person. I think um, what each of you have said is that you, your own identities then become part of our identities and that's actually pretty you know, to use anthropological terms, pretty classic. Uh, we incorporate people. Other people don't necessarily do this. But um, so I, my question is, um, I'd like to, from each of you here, what, what that experience has, I guess, done for you as a person. Um, just one point. Peter's already started to cover it a bit, but I... Uh, well, it, um, it means you have to give up ideas like, well, friendship is the main thing. No, for some people, kinship is the main thing. That's, that's where the positive basis of the relationships comes in. Until you're kin, for old people anyway, I know this doesn't apply outside the more remote areas, but for uh, people in remote, very remote areas still, um, you don't really become socially real unless you can be addressed and, and uh, referred to as uncle or niece or whatever. Um, uh, and with that always comes a certain warmth, you know. Kinship is warmth unless you're in a fight with your cousin. <laughs> um, but it also gives you another whole family. You know, you have your family of origin and then you have... I have actually more than one because it, this has happened to me twice, seriously, in Cape York. Um, and so, yes, um, we're on the phone, we get emails, and I gave up Facebook because of it. <laughs> Dr Moylan? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, on a personal level, uh, I think it's helped me become more connected to Australia, to the country. Um, it's also helped me um, connect with my family. I work with my mother. My mother um, has done research into Aboriginal culture. She's a psychologist. Um, so I've been able to work with her together um, on projects. And also, um, only uh, probably relatively recently, we've found out about um, uh, parts of our family that we didn't know existed who um, are Aboriginal people. So it's allowed me to make connections um, to that and just on a more general basis, um, doing work that I think is worthwhile and important. And thanks. Look, it's shown me my deep ignorance, um, I have to admit. You know, as a historian working first on the Pacific, um, I've, I resisted working on Australia stuff. I knew how, how much I didn't know. And so that's been a um, always, always humbling and should be something that every scholar brings to the work. I was really profoundly moved actually by um, watching communities work with materials that I'd looked at and just watching people get something completely different from uh, these materials. That was profoundly... Actually, it's really moving. 
But also, I have to say, I, I feel a kind of an extraordinary dis kind of disjunction. Uh, I started working on Fison and Howitt uh, probably about 2006. And in that time, I, I think things have got so much worse for Aboriginal people in Australia. You know, the, um, I just can't help looking at the uh, huge number of children removed and uh, the uh, high rates of poverty and unemployment. I, you know, I, okay, I've, I've got an Aboriginal friend I, who I know as a, as a neighbour, not through this stuff, but, you know, she got ch chucked off Centrelink a month ago. And so, you know, uh, there's all this good stuff happening that I have to applaud, but there's such serious structural issues in this country that makes me sick and keeps me awake at night. So I just can't help dealing with that, those kinds of issues. So thanks. Is there another question out there? Uh, it's just the lady in the green. Um, thank you. Um, this relates to the general problem of... Um, that I think Helen raised in particular about how do you return or how do you get this information from historical sources back to communities. And um, I wanted to ask Peter, with your work with Ursula McConnell's material, particularly the new, the, well, I call the new material from her trunk that was found, um, have you had the opportunity yet to talk with people, um, Eric Kuhn or in Queensland about that material that was in the trunk that was not was certainly not available before it came into existence within the museum and your work on it. Yes, I, <coughs> I've deposited a copy of the photographs or a large selection of them with the Cultural Centre at Aracoon. I went up there with a, a USB and went through it with a number of people in that room and we had shifts of different families coming in and looking. One of the problems was that uh, nobody really recognised anyone anymore because the, uh, the last photographs were taken in 1934 um, and the trunk wasn't found in a demolition site until 2006. And it took a, a, f a couple of years for me to do a full inventory and then get everything scanned and, and lodged. Um, I think the photographs would, if the more work we, we can do on finding out who it was, and Ursula was very naughty, she didn't leave us a list. Um, you just get a photo. But from uh, things she wrote in news newspapers and other sources, I think I can pin down at least some of the people um, and give them names and then the relatives can, uh, can be happy with that. The written materials, it might take another generation of cultural change for them to become of a lot of interest up there. It's still a very visual approach to things, um, but that will change and it'll change particularly as the grandchildren go out to boarding school, for example, come back and then there's uh, some issue triggers a, a strong interest in the past, like another mining proposal. We've probably got time for another one or two questions, if there was anything uh, burning that anyone had. Uh, yes, just here in the black. Just went to get the microphone there. Uh, thanks very much for all those papers. They were uh, all um, fantastically interesting. I just had a question for Bess. Um, the work that you're doing around the, um, the history of map making and for, um, in particular things like the instructions from the Surveyor General about... Um, how maps were to be made and um, that's all uh, super interesting particularly from the point of view of someone who does a lot of native title work and relies on a lot of maps and in general my experience is that um, native title researchers use a lot of maps but the interrogation of the maps themselves aren't necessarily um, with that sort of um, forensic understanding of their making, the circumstances of their making and I'm just wondering about... Um, um, how you pieced some of those histories together about the map making? Is there much published um, research on that or is that something you yourself had to go through the archives, um, um, the archives of the Office of the Surveyor General, for example? Yeah, that's right. Um, a lot of these are in the um, estate records um, institutions rather than in collections per se. 
So, yeah, it is a matter of, of also using um, other people's research that they've done to be able to pull that out. So, um, I've looked at, like, history of uh, surveyors. Uh, they'll often mention these things. Or sometimes some of the old uh, historical papers, say, done from... Um, Royal Institutes of whatever, <laughs> they've done publications in the 1920s and 30s. So it's it's almost like going um, back to the the source of where someone's got that record, then going back another source further and then back further again. So just tracing and tracking it down. But um, I think in those state um, records, um, there's a lot of uncatalogued information um, which will have a lot of information that could be useful. And they're starting to digitise and scan those things. So I think there's a lot to be found there. And was there a, a final question? Yep, just down here to round us out. We'll just get you the microphone there. Thanks. Uh, I, I wanted to ask about another, I guess, massive national product pro project of reconciliation, which has begun but hasn't gone that far, of actually bringing back Aboriginal names for all of the places that have European names. You know, it's, it's started to happen in some places and with some really important places like Uluru, but there's lots where it hasn't. And um, the work that each of you is doing is, is very relevant to that. Uh, and so is, the, I think, the, you know, the mechanical work of getting those names to be uh, somehow presented in a, in a way that people will pronounce them well because if you're just driving past and you see a name written out in an orthography, it doesn't automatically happen that you'll know how to pronounce it. Indeed, linguists often get, you know, criticised for uh, producing errors like that. So, but w with modern technology, there, there could be some ways around that. So I just wanted to know how, how you see uh, that project and how you see your work uh, contributing to it. Yeah, I've cherished this hope for actually 50 years rather than 40, um, and uh, having mapped <coughs> many thousands of places in the Northern Territory as well as South Australia and, and North Queensland, <coughs> it always makes me upset to see the maps remaining, the official maps remaining blank <coughs> with only very few names. It's now possible to, <coughs> to put Aboriginal names on a large, <coughs> a large number of places that, uh, that don't bear them now. <coughs> but there's a, there's a looming problem. <coughs> in the more remote parts of the country, there are Aboriginal representative bodies who think it's their job to keep that information from the public, uh, to not educate the public about, about the landscape, but to keep it locked up in what's called a, a uh, site register or whatever. Um, I think these people have got it wrong, um, and I think it's destructive, and it will just perpetuate the myth that no one's been there and no one's there now. Um, this is a question I actually asked the panel yesterday, <laughs> so <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, and so it's something that is of interest to me too. And, and from um, what I learnt from yesterday from the presentations is um, quite a few people were talking about the long game, <laughs> that um, learning language and, and giving it back to the community is very important and, um, yeah, place names are important too, but, um, yeah, that it's going to be a long game. <laughs> Um, one of the things we found uh, in the Melbourne Museum papers was a, a list of names roughly corresponding to contemporary um, uh, uh, Melbourne suburbs uh, that were collected from Barak in um, about 19, uh, the end of the 19th century, the last couple of years. And so we wrote a conversation piece on that and, and um, our linguist, Stephen Moray, actually added quite a good description on, on pronunciation, uh, which I think was actually essential. I mean, uh, for me, I grew up in New Zealand and, and I still remember, you know, the push to properly pronounce Māori names uh, as, you know, something people just started doing it. You know, other people would say, ah, why are you saying it like that? But, you know, gradually, as part of the long game, People learn and they do it. And so I, I think it, it can happen. Um, we're renaming in Melbourne some of the electorates, uh, but not necessarily, I mean, with, with names of very important Aboriginal people, William Cooper in particular. Uh, so there's recognition at that level, but not 
um, yeah, so that's... And if I could just add two things to round this out, one is I think the media is really crucial in normalising the discussion about names. So when it starts to become something that the media does, then you hear it and then that becomes the normal thing to say. And, and the second bit that I would add, so I'd, I think that everyone should be putting pressure on media organisations and certainly within the ABC we've been pushing to have more of a focus on this. And the second point that, that I would make is that when it comes to electorate names, that's something that anyone can make submissions to. So in the Northern Territory there was an electorate in the far south called McDonnell and there was a move to change that to Namajira. Now there was quite a bit of uh, backlash against that but ultimately there was more support for it. So that changed. So it's now the member from Namajira that sits in the Northern Territory Assembly. That was because of people power and people saying, hold on, here's an eloquent reason of why this should happen. So um, I just wanted to add that in as well. Did you have another just point? So? Yeah, just one more. It was, um, I think Ray mentioned it yesterday when he said that there are already a lot of Aboriginal names um, that are known and place names that are used too. So not to forget those as well. Yeah, here you go. <laughs> I think another important thing that's happened in New South Wales is that the Geographical Names Board for New South Wales that I'm a councillor to, I've actually sat on it, which was great, but um, now has an Aboriginal um, place naming officer. I think it's the first jurisdiction in Australia to do that. New South Wales has been very active in getting place naming replaced. Um, dual name, dual naming happening. Um, and so um, Noddy <laughs> is going to be doing that and um, I look forward to seeing what comes out of her work. Yeah, and, and certainly lots of discussion still happening on that and here in the ACT with the Place Names Committee, lots of pressure being put on them to think about this as well. Look, that rounds us out. Thanks so much for all the questions and the discussion there and a special thank you to our guests, Dr Elizabeth Moylan, Associate Professor Helen Gardner and Dr Peter Sutton. Great to have you all along. Thank you.